Okay, so this is going to be a, hopefully as quick as I can make it, a um, little lesson on reminding you of how to simplify expressions. Uh, kind of the idea is you have to realize that calculus itself, kind of in this reading, take your time and read through the actual uh, packet that I've given you, that calculus itself is not really a hard concept. It's two ideas. This idea of that there's an instantaneous rate of change, which is really a division process. We're going to take the the average rates of change and look at smaller and smaller and smaller, divide them into smaller and smaller increments, and then apply the limiting process and come up with a answer for an instantaneous rate of change. And then the second part of calculus is this idea of area of irregular regions, which is kind of a multiplicative process. If you're doing a length times a height, and but using rectangles and using the limit process on the rectangles to add up to become what our distance traveled is, or the area under the curve. And so the idea is calculus itself is very simple. What makes calculus hard is the fact that we have to do algebra in order to manipulate these equations and expressions and things that we're going to be working with. And, and so the idea here is that simplifying is crucial to your success in this class. So we're going to do this little set of notes where we are going to remind ourselves of some strategies for simplifying and what we mean, what it means to actually simplify. Um, there might not be a necessarily simplest form. It's actually just recognizing you have equivalent forms of the same expression or equation. And of course, on multiple choice, you have to make sure you choose the answer that applies and recognize that what you have and what might be an answer choice are the same. Okay, So we'll start with factoring because that's always a good choice um, when we're doing the limits, especially when you get that 0 over 0, that indeterminate form, that what you know is that you have a chance of removing the division by 0 problem, which would then allow you to calculate the limit. So we're going to do things like look for common factors, look for special products. These you should know, memorize, and love them. Uh, can we factor the trinomial? Can we guess and check? Can we do factoring by grouping? Can we use synthetic division? Just like we reviewed in our packets from previous, that sometimes we get polynomials and synthetic division is going to come into play. Okay. So for example here, we'll take a look at the first one. And this is similar to some of the things that you've already been doing, but it's mostly just, hey, we have to remember to, to be able to factor uh, that this expression, I can factor out a GCF of x, leaves me with x squared minus 9. On the bottom, I can play around with, we'll do just do guess and check. This is easy enough. Uh, factors of 12 that add to 7, minus 3 and minus 4. And we can get to our x, x plus 3 x minus 3 over x minus 3, x minus 4. We can then remove the discontinuity. Okay, and we need to make sure we know what this means when we can remove it, that the expression that I end up with is exactly the same as the expression I started with, except when x equals 3, because that's the location of the whole. So that's kind of the idea of where we're going to be kind of using this. This is going to help us calculate limits by helping us use algebra to remove the discontinuity that we have. Okay. All right, let's take a look at another one. This one might be a little bit harder, so let's see what we're doing here first. First suggestion is you always look for GCF. So I'm going to pull out the 4. So I'm left with x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x and then plus 10. And then I pull out a 2 in the bottom. That leaves me with x minus 2. And the idea here is, is that if you're kind of in calculus and you're doing limits, the idea is you probably have a division by 0 problem. So if I want to know what might be a candidate for being a factor of the top, look to the bottom and see what your factors there that are in the bottom. I'm going to check and see. I want to know, is x minus 2 a factor of the numerator? Okay. I'm going to apply the remainder theorem, which is I'm going to plug the 2 into the polynomial. Uh, let's just call this p of x for the moment. And so I'm going to calculate p of 2, the candidate for the 0. And when you plug that in, you get 8 minus 8 minus 10 plus 10, which is 0. 
So we're like, okay, so 2 is a 0 at the top. Then I'm going to use synthetic division. You can usually kind of show your work over on the side. Bring your coefficients, negative 2, negative 5, 10. Drop your 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. You get 0 in the required location for the remainder. We can now come back to our problem now that we've done this work. And let's reduce here as well. 2 goes into 4 twice. So we have a 2 times x minus 2, right? Because we decided it went into it evenly. And then we have left here x squared plus 0x minus 5, or x squared minus 5 over x minus 2. Then we can cancel, remove the discontinuity. 2 x squared minus 5 is our solution, except when x equals 2, which is that location of the whole. So again, we have this idea that we have a removable discontinuity, which means the limit is going to exist, and we are going to be able to calculate that. Uh, we usually don't factor x squared minus 5 at this point because it's considered prime over reals, doesn't factor nicely, and usually that's good enough when the problems that we're going to be working with. Okay? So now let's take a look over to the next page. So we're now getting a little bit more complex complicated as we go, a little bit more complex. Then we go to, well, we've been dealing with some fractions where things simplify out nicely, but sometimes we have complex fractions. Okay? And the example here, like suppose x is equal to 5, then clearly this is going to be a 0 over 0 kind of indeterminate form when x equals 5. So maybe I'm going to be interested in calculating a limit as x goes to 5. So I'm going to need to remove the discontinuity. And part of that strategy is I don't want to have compound fractions or complex fractions. I want to eliminate them. The strategy that you will use, and you need to get used to this because we're going to use it a lot this year, is we are going to multiply by the least common multiple of all the many denominators, which means the denominators located in the top and the denominators located in the bottom. This denominator is the big denominator, so I'm not even looking at that. I'm only looking at the many denominators located in the problem, and I'm looking for the least common multiple of those. I want the least common denominator. Uh, the smallest number they all divide into, which is going to be 25x squared. Now, the rule is when you are manipulating expressions that you must only manipulate them by multiplying by a form of 1, okay? If you get in a bad habit of saying times 25x squared and you don't do the bottom part of this, they will not give you credit because you have poor math communication. You're going to have something written, and then what you mean and what you actually wrote are two different things, so you have to be very, very careful about this. Show what you're actually multiplying by. I like to add the grouping symbols around the numerator and the denominator to remind myself to distribute when I am doing this. And when I distribute, I'm doing top times top, 25x squared times 1 over x. The denominator, the mini denominator, should always cancel when you do the distribution. So we end up with 25x minus, now the 5s are going to cancel, 5x squared over... Now when we do the bottom, bottom times bottom, we're going to do the 25x squared, the x squared, the many denominator will cancel. I'm left with 25. And then over here, the 25s are going to cancel, so minus x squared. So immediately I'm in a better spot than I was because I have managed to get rid of the fractions in fractions. Now I can have a GCF pulled out. Let's pull out a 5x. And typically, I like to, in my polynomial, if the highest degree is negative, I like to pull the negative out, so I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to reorder it so that the it's in standard form where the degree starts with large and goes small. If I pull minus 5x from this term, I'm left with x. If I pull minus 5x from this term, I'm left with minus 5. Over here, I'm going to do the same thing. This is the difference of perfect squares. You could think of it as 25 plus, or 5 plus x, 5 minus x, but I, again, I like to pull that negative out, so I'm going to pull the negative out. 
which would make it x squared minus 25, so x plus 5, x minus 5. And as soon as we do that, we say, yay, we've got a removable discontinuity that we can take out, and we can simplify ourselves down. Oh, and look, the negatives also cancel. Paying attention to that, I end up with 5x over x plus 5, except when x equals 5. So these two expressions are exactly the same in every case except x equal to 5, which would be great if I was doing a limit as x goes to 5 because I have a removable discontinuity and I can calculate that limit. Okay. Now, sometimes we can have complex fractions in disguise. That This idea is that you remember that negative exponents mean 1 over or reciprocal. So these are actually fractions. If you ever see a negative exponent, that is really a fraction, okay? And the idea here is, is we want to not have those fractions in there. So we want to be very, very careful about this. Um, expressions that you have like this, where you have this x to the 2 thirds, and there should be a minus right here in your notes. For some reason, we lost a negative there. That we can rewrite that as this. And we have to recognize we actually have a fraction when we are dealing with that, okay? Usually when we are simplifying expressions that involve radicals and variables in the denominator, we like to write them in this exponential form. However, when we go to evaluate the expression, we usually do that in the radical or denominator form because that makes it easier to figure out where things are, okay? So it's kind of like, this is easier to work with algebraically, but if I'm plugging a number in, I need to know that I'm squaring the number I plug in, then converting, multiplying it by 2, and then doing the reciprocal of it. All right, so let's take a look at this example. So even though in this problem we have this x to the negative 1, you have to recognize even though it doesn't look like complex fractions, it actually is a complex fraction. Okay, And so the idea here is that what we want you to recognize is that this is equivalent to 3 minus 6 over x minus 2 and 6 minus 12x over x squared minus 4. That we have this idea of denominators within denominators and within the fraction. You also need to make sure that you don't just move this up to the top and this down to the bottom because of the fact that this is 3 minus and 6 minus. These are not factors that I can move up from the bottom to the top. These are terms. And terms are not, you can't split your denominator when you have this. And then once you recognize that you have a complex fraction, your LCM in this problem is going to be x squared minus 4 over x squared minus 4. And so that is what we are going to multiply by when we do our top times top and our bottom times bottom. So we have this times the 3, 3x three squared minus 4. Then we have this here, and you kind of have to think in your head, this is really x plus 2, x minus 2. We're going to end up with the many denominator cancels. The factor I have left is x plus 2. Okay, over here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do the 6 times x squared minus 4 minus 12x because the denominator will cancel completely. And so the idea is that we can get ourselves to this location and then we can simplify from here. Um, I will tell you that as you look at this, if we kind of collect like terms here, we're going to have 3x squared, you have a minus 6x, you have minus 12 and minus 12, so minus 24x. Oops, sorry, minus 24. They don't make it a little negative, your uh, algebra mistakes there when you're doing it. Um, then we have on the bottom, uh, you know, I should have planned ahead. Really technically, I should have probably not put the 3 in, or I should have pulled out a GCF, because that would have made it a little easier, but I'll pull it out here. Minus 2x minus uh, 3 times 8. All right, and then over here, I'm going to pull the 6 out. Let's just do that automatically. And then when I pull the 6 out, I'm going to have x squared minus 4 minus 2x, okay? 6x squared minus 2x minus 4. And then I can factor this 
3, x minus 4, x plus 2. All right. And then we have our factors of this one, which would be x, and the factors of 4 that add to 2. So x minus 2, this is not going to work. I think it doesn't factor. All right, and so since it doesn't factor, we just leave it as, uh, we can reduce this part, obviously, and so let's leave it as 2 times x squared minus 2x minus 4, okay? Now, this tells us a lot of information about whatever the zeros are in the bottom, then they're really not removable because I can't factor them out, which would mean you have vertical asymptotes, okay? Now, let's take a look at our radicals. This idea is that sometimes we have radicals and rational exponents that processes where you rationalize are important, that you have to recognize that 1 over square root of 2 and square root of 2 over 2 are exactly the same number. And so while really the purpose of this was just to make the unit circle more uniform, the idea is they're both just equivalent expressions. They are equivalent numbers. And you, depending on which one you get in your work, you have to recognize if this is a multiple choice, that's the other one. However, rationalizing is going to be helpful when we have issues like this. Like, for example, right now, if I wanted to put in x equal to 0, okay? If x equals 0 in this expression, I end up with 0 over 0. That idea of I may have a removable discontinuity. And so what happens is, you are like, well, how do I factor, quote unquote, this so that I can remove the division by zero problem? Well, the trick that we're going to do here is we are going to rationalize using the conjugate. This is called the RATCON method for short. The uh, conjugate, remember, if you have A plus B, the conjugate is going to be a minus b. Okay, you simply just negate the second term. So, and you can only multiply by a form of one. So, what we're going to multiply by is the square root of x plus three plus square root of three, and then square root of x plus three plus square root of three. So that the idea is, I'm multiplying by a form of one. We are going to multiply top times top, bottom times bottom. We are not actually going to multiply the bottom out because remember the factor we're trying to cancel is x. So our objective is to leave the bottom in this factored form. It has an extra little nasty looking factor on the bottom, that's okay. And I'm hoping that if I do stuff to the top that I will be able to pull an x factor out and simplify. All right, so we are gonna do the foiling process when we do this. So we end up with x plus 3, because the square roots will cancel. We will have minus square root of 3 times square root of 3, which is 3. And then check your middle terms out. Remember, this is a minus b, a plus b. The point of using the conjugate is that when we multiply those out, you get a squared minus b squared. The middle terms go away. So I pretty much have a squared and b squared, and then I'm done with the whole foiling out process. Now, notice what happens. Plus 3 minus 3, I get x over x, square root of x plus 3 plus square root of 3. I can now cancel the division by 0 problem that I was having, and I will be able to calculate the limit. Okay? What I basically did here is I rationalized and this is a little different than what you may have seen this in your prior classes. I rationalize the numerator. Rationalization really is this idea of all I'm doing is moving the radicals from wherever they are to the other location, from the numerator to the denominator or the denominator to the numerator to get it in a different form that may help me remove the division by zero problem that I was having. Okay? And now you can see that technically I should say where x doesn't equal 0 or except when x equals 0 because there's a hole located there and I've managed to remove the division by 0 problem so I have a point discontinuity. Okay. All right, let's take a look at example 6. Again, just this idea of can we rationalize 1 minus square root of 5. You're going to multiply by 1 plus square root of 5, 1 plus square root of 5. 
on the top, which is where it's ending up, I'm not going to multiply it out. Remember, because I'm trying to see stuff that cancels. On the bottom, I am going to FOIL, and I'm going to remember the middle terms drop out, so I really just need 1 squared minus square root of 5 squared, 5, 4, 1 plus square root of 5 over negative 4. I can cancel the 4s, and I'm left with simply negative 1 plus square root of 5. So I've removed the radical from the denominator and got an equivalent number or value. Alright, and then sometimes simplifying means that you have to kind of make them harder before you can make them easier. Uh, we have to understand this idea of that function notation, right, that I can substitute numbers in, whatever goes here. Uh, if it's a smiley face, it's going to go here and here and here. That it doesn't matter, whatever is in those parentheses gets substituted in, okay? So, for example, we have this function, remember the x that was normally in this location is nothing more than a placeholder. It's holding the place for whatever is in the parentheses. So f of 1 would be 2 times 1 squared plus 1, square root of 1 plus 1, and then you simply do your arithmetic and you simplify that um, and get the actual value that you're going to get, which is basically 3 over square root of 2. You could rationalize 3 square root of 2 over 2, doesn't really matter. Uh, just know, recognize the same answer. If I was going to plug in negative 1, negative 1 squared plus 1, square root of, make that a negative 1, right, because I'm plugging it in, and then my negative 1 plus 1, and in that case, I go, wait a minute, I have a division by 0 problem that is undefined. We could say D and E, do not say null set, that is not, I'm not finding a set, I'm evaluating this value, finding the y value for when x is negative 1, and it does not exist, or it's undefined, not a real number. Okay. Now we can also plug in things like x plus 2. So initially you would go to x plus 2 squared plus x plus 2 over square root of x plus 2 plus 1. That the idea is, is that we are simply plugging this in. Now, we might want to go ahead and simplify this. Um, I will tell you that we want to get into the habit on this. The bottom, of course, is just square root of x plus 3. We are typically going to like things factored. I am not going to multiply this out in order to factor it again. I'm going to recognize that I have a GCF already of x plus 2. And so I'm going to pull that out. Do not make it harder and, and sledgehammer this out. Pull out the common factor, I'm left with a 2 times x plus 2, because I divided one of them out, factoring is dividing, and then plus 1, and then I can very quickly get to a factored form, factored form is always considered better, of 2x plus 4 plus 1 plus 5 over square root of x plus 3. That, that's typically going to be what we consider the most simplest version of this, okay? So just make a note to yourself that you always look for a G, GCF and you pull that out because we usually prefer factored form, right? If I can, you can plug anything you want in, we can plug in e to the x, 2 times e to the x squared plus e to the x all over square root of e to the x plus 1, and again, I'm going to do common factor, e to the x, 2 e to the x plus 1 over square root e to the x plus 1. Okay. If I plug in sine of x minus 4, it should not matter that I'm changing my functions that I'm plugging in, I would have, now can we kind of go to the simplified form, because technically if I have 2x squared plus x, aren't I always pulling out an x? So I would pull out the sine of x minus 4, and then I would have left 2 sine of x minus 4 plus 1 all over square root sine of x minus 4 plus 1. Okay. And so basically, even if I went f of pink elephant, you get the idea that what you're going to do is you're going to put in the placeholder and then work with the problem. Okay. Um, and it's a necessary 
step, something that you need to know how to do. All right? And you want to make sure that when you are working with algebra, that you try to avoid these careless mistakes, the negative signs, the addition and arithmetic errors, the incorrect use of your arithmetic rules, because that is going to mess you up. All right, we've already talked about the importance of this expression. So since that's the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line, we are going to be working with this expression quite a bit, especially in the beginning of Chapter 3. So we have to make sure that we understand how to plug and chug with this expression minus parentheses your f of x that this should be so second nature to you that you don't even have to think about how you would evaluate this. And then I'm going to sledgehammer this out and look for things that cancel. 3x squared plus 2 times 3, 6xh plus 3h squared minus 5x minus 5h plus 1 minus 3x squared plus 5x minus 1 all over h. And remember we talked about, you've done this correctly, if things will cancel out, plus 5x minus 5x plus 1 minus 1. All of the terms that we have left are all divisible by h. I have 1, 2, 3 terms. I'm going to pull the h out. 6x plus 3h minus 5 all over h. Remove the division by 0 problem. And then I have a formula I can work with that is going to give me the average rate of change. And then if I wanted to turn this into an instantaneous rate of change, remember that we can add the limit as h goes to 0 in front of this, which would mean that basically to calculate this for this function, we're really taking the limit as h goes to 0 of 6x plus 3h minus 5. The division by 0 problem is removed, and we get 6x minus 5, our derivative that we were talking about in a previous section. Okay. Now, another important skill is decomposition of functions. And so the idea is, is that we have to recognize, and you've seen this already when we were doing limits of a composition, you have to recognize an inside function so that we can do something with it and then recognize what's the outside function. So we need to decompose. So when you see something like h of x equals this, what you're going to do is you're going to think of the inside function g. You're typically going to go, let's make that 4x minus 1. Right? Identify the inside function and then recognize that the outside function would have been 3 square root of x. And so you saw this already in this idea of calculating limits of a composition. We have to decompose it, figure out where the inside went, and then use that to figure out where the outside went. So we identify the inside versus the outside function in a composition so that we can break that apart. All right, and then we're going to end this set of notes going back to some very important functions, exponentials, and logarithms. And that you have to be very familiar with these, know your exponent rules, and know that a logarithm is just an exponent. So if you need to, please review these so that you are prepared to work problems. Uh, we primarily use base E when we are in calculus. okay? And so that is called the natural base, and that is something that occurs very often, and we're going to use it. A uh, very special limit that you look at. Um, if I were to calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n over n, we can take a quick look at that on our calculator. All right, so in our calculator, I put my formula in right here. I take a look at the graph, and since I'm letting n go to infinity, I'm really considering, or x go to infinity, I'm considering the n behavior. And you take a look at the graph, and very quickly you will recognize you do have a horizontal asymptote. If I go to my table, I'm going to set my table up. I'm going to start at 1,000 because you want to go to the end. I'm going to go up by 10,000. You can go by however much you want. And take a look at the table values. Look at the number that I have here. And there should be a ding, 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 hey, doesn't that look like E? And that does happen to be E. 
So when we're looking at this, this is another one of those special limits, like the ones that we just did for the trig ones, that you'll just simply need to memorize. That the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n, that that is always equal to e, our natural base. Okay? So now let's go over, let's take a look at some log problems. I want to find an exact solution to this equation, and then I want to give a three decimal approximation. All right, now when I'm working with this problem, what I like to do is, typically you're going to take the log of both sides. So I take the log of 6 times 3 to the 2x, and you can't multiply 6 and 3, order of operations, so be very careful. Natural log of 2 to the x plus 1. We are going to utilize the log properties, which says if I multiply, I'm really adding. And if I have a power, what I'm really doing is putting the power and multiplying it in front. So this would become 2x natural log of 3 equals, bring your x plus 1 down here, times natural log of 2. That we recognize that natural log of 6 is a number, a decimal number, but a number. Natural log of 3, a number. Natural log of 2, a number. So I'm basically now just going to collect like terms. I'm going to go ahead and let's multiply out over here. We're going to distribute. So I have x natural log of 2 plus natural log of 2. Anything that has an x, you need to get your friends together, put them on the same side. So I have 2x natural log of 3 minus x natural log of 2. Let's move the natural log of 6 over this way. Natural log of 2 minus natural log of 6. Okay, over here, I'm going to factor the x out. 2, natural log of 3, minus natural log of 2. I like to start putting things back together when they're just numbers, because I have a number minus a number. We might as well write this as the natural log of 2 over 6, or 1 third. Start putting it back. Over here, same thing. I'm going to divide this to the other side, but I'm going to think of this as x times the natural log of... 3 squared, 9 over 2. That I can take these logs that are just numbers and, and make them one number, and then divide and get my x equals natural log of 1 third over natural log of 9 halves. Also known as, if you remember what your change of base formula is, is that means that you must have been doing a log base 9 halves of one third, that these are equivalent expressions for this answer. And then we could basically go to our calculator, we can type these in, just go to my home screen, and I'm going to do the natural log of one third, close your parentheses, divided by the natural log of my nine halves. And get a decimal answer, and we want three decimals as always in our Calculator, so I have negative 0.730, and we have our final answer, okay? Um, so that's kind of the idea of being able to use those log properties, okay? Being able to identify that things are equivalent are important. So the idea here is, is like, which of the following are equivalent to the natural log of 4? Knowing the natural log properties. Now, what you have to remember is what you can do and what you can't do. There is no property that says when I add logs that I'm doing anything. Okay. Uh, well, there is, but when I add the logs together, I'm doing the natural log of 3 times 1, and that's not the same as natural log of 4. Alright, so the natural log of 3 times 1, which is the natural log of 3, is not equivalent to the natural log of 4. This one is playing on your change of base formula. So when you look at this one, you recognize that this is really the same as saying I'm going to do the log base 2 of 8. And this is saying what exponent do I raise a base of 2 to in order to get 8? And that answer is 3. Again, not the same as natural log of 4. All right, so these two are distractors. These are the ones that are basically, as it says down here, these are bait for the easy prey who have not memorized the properties. So if you choose those two, then you are incorrect. 
Now these you might be looking at, what in the world are those? This is what we call preview of coming attractions. These are some notations that we're going to be using a little bit later in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Okay, Related, of course, to the calculus portion of this. So right now, because this was an actual 1985 AP test question. Right? And so what this would be, once you figure out what this notation means, this is more what you're going to end up with. Okay? And so now we're comparing C, D, and E together to figure out which of those. We've already eliminated A and B. And as you can see down here, now clearly this is exponential. This has nothing to do with the log of 4. We can pretty much cross C off. Right? And so noticeably wrong, gone. And we also know that E should be noticeably wrong, or sorry, this actually should say D should be noticeably wrong, okay? Let's do D before we confuse each other. Because if I were using the log properties on this, this would be the natural log of 4 to the 4th power minus 3, which is the natural log of 16. And you're like E 2.7-ish to what power equals 16? Well, that minus, that's not going to work out, okay? So we're going to eliminate this. There are two ways to show that E is the correct answer. Uh, when you are doing the subtraction, you could go, hey, natural log of 1, the exponent I raise E to to get 1 is 0, and the natural log of 4 minus 0 is the natural log of 4, okay? I don't know why I'm missing several things in my typed version of this. So check, that works out. Or we can use the property that subtraction is division. The natural log of 4 over 1, 4 divided by 1, is 4. So the correct answer is to recognize that E is the equivalent expression to the natural log of 4. All right, maybe a better question here, which of the following is not equal to natural log of 4? And again, that's an idea of just testing these properties. All right, this one we just saw. Clearly, natural log 4 over 1, which is natural log of 4. So that one is equal, so not one that I'm going to choose. This one uses the log property, natural log of 2 squared, which happens to be natural log of 4. We are not choosing that one. All right, let's skip this one for a moment. Let's go over here. The natural log of 8 over 2, because when you subtract exponents, you must have been dividing the results, which is natural log of... Four, we are not choosing that one. Here we're using the property that the exponential function and the log function are inverses of each other. So they cancel each other out. So these two will cancel. We're going to have natural log of 4 left. Not going to choose that one. And since they're inverses, that means f of g of x returns x and g of f of x equals x. They work both ways. These two will cancel out. We get natural log of 4. Do not choose that one. All right. So now we have this idea of these two that we're working with. All right. Now let's come over here and let's think about this natural log of 16 over 2 and then I've got natural log of 4 over natural log of 1. All right. Now this one, let's talk about it. If I have your natural log of 1, we already know what that's equal to. We have what power do I raise e to to get 1? And that answer is 0. And you could say, like, hey, wait a minute, that is undefined. That does not exist. I have a division by 0 problem. Okay. So now by default, we're like, well, this must be the correct answer. But we have to figure out how in the world are we going to get this to the correct answer. All right, so what we're playing on here is you kind of have to recognize that 16 is really 4 squared over 2, and that the power, according to our log property, says I can move that to the front, 2 natural log of 4 divided by 2, and then I can cancel the 2s, and it is indeed equal to the natural log of 4. So we're not choosing that one. And I crossed off the one over here, and I should not have crossed it off because... That is the one that is the only selection, if we read the question carefully, that we are trying to determine 
the following that is not equal to the natural log of 4, then G is the appropriate answer selection for that. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a little bit of an overview um, of what we are talking about with some simplifying before we get into using simplifying expressions to evaluate limits.